Hello friends, it's Katie back with another episode of my vlog and of course another Cinema Club Sunday Roundup. We did things a little differently this week in Cinema Club Land and we decided to watch four films from the same franchise. And so we watched Superman, Superman 2, Superman 3, and Superman 4, uh, released between 1978 and 1987. Of course, all of these films are starring Christopher Reeve as Superman, Margot Kidder as Log Lois Lane, uh, Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor in three out of four of the films, um, and uh, the guys who play Jimmy Olsen and Perry White, whose names I can't remember right now, uh, same actors in all four movies. Um, I know there have been a lot of Superman movies made throughout history, but I am a child of the 70s. I grew up with Christopher Reeve's Superman. He's my Superman. And so I wanted to sit down and watch these four movies in a row and see how they do right next to each other without any years in between them separating them. Um, I think most people have seen Superman from 1978, um, one of the biggest superhero blockbusters of all time. I think the first superhero blockbuster of all time. Um, of course, like I said, starring Christopher Reeve and um, Gene Hackman, um, starring ostensibly Marlon Brando as Jor-El. He gets the top credit on the movie, but he's only in it at the very beginning in the scene on Krypton, or Krypton, I should say. That's the way he says it. Um, and I'll be honest, um, the scene, that opening scene on Krypton, doesn't actually do that much for the movie. Um, and I feel like it actually gets in the way of the first Superman movie. It's beautiful. Um, it's technically marvelous. The special effects are really cool, except for the part where Krypton starts exploding and everyone's just sort of falling through the air. That looks a little cheesy. Um, but ultimately that scene feels unnecessary and it feels like the only reason why it's in the movie is so that they could put Marlon Brando in the movie and have Marlon Brando as the top name up at the beginning of the credits telling everyone to come watch this movie because of course at the time that this film was made Christopher Reeve was a complete unknown and you wouldn't make a what was it 55 million dollar budget largest budget uh, to date movie uh, riding on the name of an actor that nobody knows so of course they hired Marlon Brando to be in it they hired Gene Hackman to be in it to pump up the star level. Um, and then a lot of uh, service gets given to that opening scene on Krypton. And it really makes it kind of heavier than it needs to be. Um, that's my w actual one criticism of this movie. I think Superman is like nine out of 10 stars and I'm taking one off for the kind of useless Krypton scene at the beginning. Um, the other thing that's a little weird and confusing about the first Superman movie is the very opening scene, we see uh, the space bad guys who actually come back in the second movie as the antagonists of the movie. We watch them get uh, sentenced and imprisoned in like a, uh, what is it called? The Phantom Zone, which is like a floating two-dimensional uh, space prison, if you will. So we're shown them being um, tried, convicted, and imprisoned right at the beginning of the first Superman movie, and then they don't come back at all for that whole movie. They come back in the second movie, um, but the second movie starts with a flashback to the first movie, and it's that exact same scene. So both movies effectively start with the same scene, which is mildly confusing, to say the least. When you put the movie on, you're like, wait, am I watching the right one? Um, and there's also a whole recap of the first movie at the beginning of the second movie, which feels really bizarre and out of place. Um, and I think I figured out why in doing my research for this vlog, I found out kind of oddly. Um, so the first film and most of the second film were directed by Richard Donner. He's the director of The Omen, um, produced by the Salkins. Um, the two films were actually filmed simultaneously, Superman 1 and Superman 2. They made both of them simultaneously, and then when they got about 75% of the way through making both movies, the producers said, hey, wait a minute, let's finish the first one. Let's stop filming the second one. Finish the first one, see how it does at the box office, see what audience response to it is, and hopefully it's favorable, and then we finish the second movie. So they stopped production on Superman 2, like I said, 75% of the way through. Superman comes out. Obviously, it's a huge smash hit. Everybody loves it. Everybody wants Superman 2. Uh, but then there's some kind of falling out between Richard Donner, the director, and the Salkins, the producers. And the Salkins wind up firing Donner. Um, and it's a, this kind of public thing. And there's some bad blood. 
And some of the actors on the movie uh, apparently criticized the Salkins for the way they treated Richard Donner, um, most notably Margot Kidder, who plays Lois Lane. Um, and some people think that's why she doesn't have much of a role in the third movie, kind of a little punishment for her from the Salkins. I don't, I don't know how true that is, but Lois Lane really isn't in the third movie. She's in it right at the beginning, then she goes on vacation, and she really isn't there for the rest of the thing. So... Take uh, take that little Hollywood gossip for what it might be worth. Um, but yeah, Superman. Uh, that first movie is amazing. Like I said, 9 out of 10. I think everybody should see it. Um, it gets a little cheesy in parts. There's some plot points that are totally unbelievable. Um, but again, you're watching a comic book brought to life on the big screen. And as soon as you think of it like that, um, you know, spoiler alert for a movie from 1978, the part at the very end of the movie where Superman flies really fast around the Earth to spin it backwards to make time go backwards is just completely nonsensical if you think about it. But if you think about it as a comic book, as a Superman comic book, it's perfect. That sort of stuff happens all the time in Superman comic books. Um, in the third Superman movie, there's a scene where uh, Superman like turns evil and he punches a hole in the side of an oil tanker and oil comes spewing out and there's a horrible, horrible oil spill. Um, and then he turns good again and he comes back to correct everything he's done, you know, bad when he was evil Superman. And in, in his fix for the leaky oil tanker, he comes along and blows his super breath at it and the, f the film just shows reverse of the oil spewing out of the ship and it's just sort of jumping back into the hole on this ship. And then Superman comes up to this open hole in the side of the ship where there's, you know, the, the oil is visible moving behind this open oil and just sort of bends the pieces back into place and then melts it with his eye uh, heat radiation beam. So again, if you're looking for something that obeys the laws of physics, you're gonna watch these movies and go, what just happened? That doesn't make any sense. But if you think of it as a comic book come to life, yes, I think I've seen that in an exact Superman comic book in the past. He just blows on some oil and it jumps back through a hole and he just sort of punches it closed and it's done. Um, so in watching all four of these movies, I found it very helpful to um, just kind of put my logical brain on hold and go, it's the comic book world. It's the world of superheroes. It's this fantastic godlike man from outer space who's come to earth okay he can do whatever and 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 i just put the logical thinking aside and went along for the ride and you guys these movies are totally fun and awesome uh the special effects for their time are amazing they've also aged pretty well there's some cheesy spots where you can see oh it's a green screen or whatever but for the most part, the aged practical effects don't get in the way of what your, you know, experience of the film is. Um, the acting from everyone is incredible, but particularly Christopher Reeve. He carries the whole fall four films um, and his ability to transition back and forth between the role of Superman and the role of Clark Kent is amazing. He puts it on display. There's one scene kind of in the middle of the first Superman movie where it's really, really on display. Uh, Superman visits Lois Lane at her apartment building. They go out for a night fly. She's all excited and has stars in her eyes. And then Superman leaves via the balcony. And of course, one second later, there's a knock on the door and Clark comes into the apartment. Christopher Reeve playing Clark Kent. He's got his shoulders rounded. He's looking down. Um, you know, it's not just the glasses that make the costume. He acts completely differently. Um, Lois walks out of the room and he kind of like straightens up and turns back into Superman for a second. And then as she comes back into the room, he just sort of schlumps back down into Clark Kent. And it's quite amazing to watch Reeve do this transformation, which again, you know, you look at it and you go, oh, it's just glasses, whatever. But it's not just the glasses, right? He's selling it to you and he's doing an incredibly good job of it. So um, I don't want to say the whole movie or all four of them rest on him, but I really do think there is something to Christopher Reeve's performance as Superman in these films that just brings the whole thing together. Um, the other unifying aspect of three out of four of the films, again, is Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor. He's amazing. Um, his portrayal of Lex Luthor is probably one of my favorite on-screen supervillains of all time. Um, and he's great in all three of the movies that he's in. Um, 
first one is the best, again. Uh, I would give the first one, again, a solid 9 out of 10. I would give all three of the sequels probably about a 7.5 out of 10. I think they're all worth watching. Um, I read a thing people were calling Superman 4 the worst movie ever made. I didn't think so. Again, it had cheesy parts. It had unbelievable parts. But it's a superhero action fantasy. So realism isn't what we're going for here, right? It's not the shtick. Um, We've got, uh, let's see, what are some other, <laughs> I'm just going off about the first one here, but I've got four movies to review. So the second film, I'm pretty sure you guys have all seen the first Superman movie, but if you haven't, go back and watch it again. It's a thousand percent worth it. Uh, in the second movie, we get our three Krypton space criminals, uh, General Zod, Ursa, and Non, who uh, managed to escape from their flat space prison, the Phantom Zone. And of course, as soon as they get out, they're like, uh, we need to get revenge on Jor-El, and Jor-El is no longer around because he died in the explosion of Krypton, so they head to Earth to catch up with Jor-El's kid and kill him. So we've got three evil Kryptonians coming to Earth. They have all the powers of Superman, but they're like total bad guys and complete bad asses. Like they dress all in black. Um, Ursa, the female uh, criminal, she's got this great habit of ripping badges and insignias off of anyone who she defeats. So as we go through the movie, she gets more and more other people's badges all over her costume, which is pretty great. Um, so they turn up on Earth looking for Superman. Meanwhile, Superman has finally been busted by Lois Lane. She's figured it out and put one and one together that Clark and Superman are the same person. So they're having this whole uh, emotional moment of realization and falling in love with each other. And Superman goes off to the Fortress of Solitude and basically gives up his superpowers to be with Lois. Now there's this kind of weird thing, again, put, put your logic on hold here. He talks to like an AI version of his mom and she tells him that there's this like pod that he can go in that's going to take away his powers. Um, but does he really want to do it? Because really, really, this is irreversible. He can't have them back. He makes the decision. He wants to be with Lois. He's going to be immortal and give up his powers. Leaves the Fortress of Solitude and immediately goes, oh no, these evil Kryptonians are here on Earth. I need my powers back. And somehow goes back to the Fortress of Solitude and gets them right back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thought he couldn't have him back. Guess he can. So that, that's a little weird one. Meanwhile, our evil Kryptonian bad guys have joined forces on Earth with none other than Lex Luthor, everybody's favorite supervillain, um, and are wreaking havoc on the planet. Not going to say much more about what happens in the end of any of these because I don't want to spoil them and I do want you guys to watch them. Um, the third movie, Superman 3, amazingly is starring Richard Pryor ah, um, as a unemployed guy who gets some training on how to program computers and then becomes just like an instant computer genius. Again, hold your logic at the door. This totally makes sense in the world of Superman comic books. Doesn't make any logical sense in reality, but that's fine. Um, he then gets like blackmail hired by this evil business tycoon played by Robert Vaughn. Um, and so Richard Pryor's character has to do things like um, reprogram a weather satellite to disrupt the Colombian coffee harvest um, and build a supercomputer that can analyze a piece of kryptonite and synthesize it so that Robert Vaughn's character can have a piece of kryptonite so that he can defeat Superman. Now, Richard Pryor's character doesn't get it quite right. He doesn't have the total formula for kryptonite. Um, and so he sticks a little bit of tar in at the end when he's synthesizing the kryptonite. And they come up with this, well, we, we started calling it creep tonight because they give it to Superman and he doesn't lose his superpowers, but he becomes a total creep. Um, he stops caring about people. He's just causing trouble. He becomes like, they find him in a bar just like drinking one day. Um, he starts lying to people. He starts uh, flying around the world causing mischief, like blowing out the Olympic torch right when someone's going to light the Olympic flame, um, straightening out the Leaning Tower of Pisa, um, some other kind of funny things like that. This is the one where he punches the hole in the side of the um, oil tanker uh, and causes the giant oil spill. So um, about two thirds, three quarters of the way through this movie, there's an incredible scene where evil Superman goes to a junkyard and suddenly Clark Kent like beams out of evil Superman's forehead 
And then we have a battle between evil Superman and Clark Kent in this junkyard. Um, not going to tell you guys how that comes out or what happens at the end of this movie. Um, but yeah, Superman 3, very interesting. It notably has a very funny opening, um, kind of a, a Rube Goldberg uh, comedy um, sequence of just one thing causing another thing causing another thing outside, which is really, really great. Um, and uh, yeah, Superman 3, better than I expected it to be. Um, and then Superman 4, which has the subtitle The Quest for Peace, really interestingly uh, comes out in 1987. And so the overarching plot of Superman 4 is that we can't have this nuclear arms race buildup of the Cold War going so crazy. So Superman has to destroy all of the nukes on Earth. Um, and the way he does this is he collects them all into a big net. Um, so we, there's a great shot of Superman out in space with sort of the curve of the Earth. And he's got this giant oversized net full of every nuclear missile on planet Earth. Um, and he sort of swings it all around like a hammer toss and throws the whole thing into the sun. Okay, <clears throat> this then inspires Lex Luthor, who's come back for the fourth movie, thank you. Um, he steals a piece of Superman's hair from a museum so that he has some of Superman's genetic material. He never says the word DNA in this, which is really interesting, 1987. I guess it's genetic material only. Boy, if that came out now, it would be DNA. Um, and he fires this little Superman's hair, he attaches it to a rocket and sends it into the sun um, and creates a new, like, evil anti-hero, but with the powers of the sun or Superman or whatever, um, called Nuclear Man. And Nuclear Man has, like, really crazy long fingernails that he can scratch Superman with and, like, give him radiation poisoning with his fingernails. Whoa! Um, the other interesting thing about Superman 4 is it has this subplot of the Daily Planet has been taken over by a new owner who wants to turn it into a tabloid newspaper. And his daughter, who's managing a lot of the day-to-day -day operations, is played by Meryl Hemingway. And she, for whatever reason, has developed this huge crush on Clark Kent. So there's a great scene in Superman 4 where Lois and Superman are going to go on a double date with Mariel Hemingway's character and Clark Kent. And uh, of course, Christopher Reeve playing both Superman and Clark Kent has to be both of them and he can't be both of them in the same place at the same time. So there's a great scene where uh, it's like at Lois's apartment and we keep having Clark leave and Superman come in by another way and then Clark has to go do something and then Superman comes in and Superman's got to go do something and Clark comes back in and um, it's played incredibly well by all of the actors uh, who are part of the scene. Um, it's great. So, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is that it's a little bit disappointing about all four movies is the transformations from Clark Kent into Superman in the first movie, the first time he does the transformation outside of the Daily Planet, he goes out on the street and he finds one of those half phone booths and he kind of looks at it like, oh God, I can't change in that. And it's this great kind of like wink at the audience about how Clark Kent transforms into Superman. Um, and he goes and does his transformation elsewhere. But my criticism of the transformations is they do it as like a video fade effect every time. It's like, Superman's like running down the street or Clark Kent is running down the street and he starts to open his shirt. You see the super logo coming from underneath. And then suddenly it's just like this video fade morph and he's in the Superman costume without doing anything else. And that's the, the majority of the transformations are shown that way, unfortunately. Um, there's one really good one. I think it's in Superman three where uh, Clark Kent runs into a photo booth and then comes out, there's a kid waiting to go into the photo booth and uh, he comes out as Superman and he grabs the strip of four photos and the four photos reveal the transformation from Clark Kent into Superman. And then he tears off the Superman one at the bottom and hands it to the kid before he goes flying away to go save the day or save Lois Lane or whatever he's saving at that uh, particular moment. And then um, in my research, I found out that that kid outside the phone booth is the same actor who plays baby Clark Kent in the very first movie. So that's kind of a cool piece of trivia. Um, so yeah, Superman one through four, highly recommended. Um, I'm gonna recommend Superman for everybody. I think that's just required viewing, part of your cultural literacy and knowledge of the history of film. 
Um, but if you enjoy Superman 1, I encourage you, keep going. Watch Superman 2. And if you like that one, watch Superman 3. And if you like that one, go for Superman 4 also. I think it's maybe the least of them, but not by far. Um, like I said, all three of the sequels are like a solid seven and a half, maybe pushing towards eight for some of them. Um, great special effects, great acting, great music, great stories, great cheesiness. We loved it. I think this week we might watch the Batman sequence uh, that starts with Tim Burton movies from the 80s. Not sure. We might do the same thing with those movies as well, though. We'll see. Um, besides four Superman movies, we watched one other movie this week, which I do want to tell you guys about, which was the fabulous Baron Munchausen from 1962, directed by Carol Zeman. Uh, this is a Czechoslovakian film that combines live action, animation, puppetry, and a bunch of other techniques. Uh, I had previously reviewed another of this director's films, which was called Invention for Destruction, several months ago on the vlog. Um, you guys can probably look it up and find my review, but um, <clears throat> man, we found both of these on a Criterion channel and they are incredible. This guy, um, what a visionary artist. He is, uh, I don't even know what to say. I'm actually rendered speechless by this film. You guys, it's beautiful. It's the adventures of Baron Munchausen, right? You know the story. Uh, our favorite sort of bombastic, boastful Baron. He begins on the moon. He visits a Turkish sultan's palace. Um, he winds up in the belly of a whale at one point in the story and beyond. He's just having his crazy, wonderful... Uh, Baroque adventures, if you will. But in this version of the story, because it's told with this amazing mix of live action and animation, uh, you know, painted set pieces with puppetry um, and a lot of restricted color work, all the scenes on the moon are blue. Uh, you know, the scenes in the belly of the whale are toned in, in the appropriate way that you would expect the interior of a whale to be toned. Um, the whale itself looks amazing. The, the animation in this film is amazing. Um, I had never heard of this director. I just found him on Criterion Channel and I am obsessed now. I want to see every single thing that he's ever made. I've only seen two of his films, but they both have blown me away so much. I am just super curious to see more of his work. So um, if you're a visual person, if you're an animation person, if you're a fantastic stories person, um, if you like weird Czech animation, uh, definitely check out The Fabulous Baron Munchausen from 1962, again, directed by Carol Zeman, um, Z-E-M-A-N, it might be Zeman, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Sorry if I'm saying it wrong. Um, and that brings us up to the end of this week. There's a whole lot of Supermans, and then the Baron Munchausen is pretty super also, but a little bit of a side turn on that one. Like I said, we might be watching a bunch of Batmans this week coming up, not quite sure. It's Henry's pick tonight, so I guess he's going to kick it off and let us know what we're watching. Um, speaking of let us know, let me know what you've been watching. And if you have any recommendations for our Cinema Club chapter over here, we'd love to hear them. I'll be back in a few more days with another episode of my vlog. Until then, take care, stay safe, and thanks so much for watching. See you later.